it's amazing when we hit rock bottom how much we cry out to God. And when everything is going well, we really give God nothing. There's a reason why God keep having believers at the mercy seat. But you know, if you will learn the lesson to don't cut God short in your good times, you will never have to hit that seat again. But you will be in a place of thanksgiving very often. But we find that we are rarely in thanksgiving and we are more so in always begging. God have mercy. God provide. God I need. God and God is saying that's the reverse of how I wanted it to be. I have you in this place because when you are in your up, you don't sow, you don't give, you don't pray, you don't worship. So I always have to bring you back to broken knees position to get your attention. If we ask anybody in this room this morning, are we absent from problems? Not one of us. The difference is what we are doing in the problem. Some people are thanking God for the problem. Some people are thanking God for making a way in the midst of... Some people are thanking God for the lesson in the problem. And some people are begging God to take it away. While some people are saying, God, you have forgotten me in the problem. But God is saying, my intention is good. My intention is always good. Because where I'm about to take you is a good place. But I need to bring you broken. Because it's only in brokenness. You see the angle I was trying to show you. Up. So I take the word today from Joshua chapter 8. From verse 1 to 8. And, and then I'll read Joshua chapter 7, verse 1 to 5. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack I. For I have delivered into your hands the king of I, its people, his city, and his land. You shall do to I and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourself. Set an ambush behind the city. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and set them out at night with these orders. Listen carefully. You are to set an ambush behind the city. Don't go very far from it. All of you be on the alert. I and all those with me will advance on the city. And when the men come out against us, as they did before, we will flee from them. They will pursue us until we have lured them away from the city. For they will say, they are running away from us as they did before. So when we flee from them, you are to rise up from the ambush and take the city. The Lord your God will give it to, into your hand. When you have taken the city, set it on fire. Do what the Lord has commanded. See to it, you have my orders. Let's take a rewind. Joshua chapter 7. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things of God. Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. 
sent two or three thousand men to take it and do not weary the whole army for the only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up but they were routed by the men of Ai who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. My sermon is titled this morning, Great Men Face Great Defeat. You may be seated this morning. For those who are taking notes and who are joining us via media, the sermon is entitled, Great Men Face Great Defeat. Remember how I started, why God always has to break us and bring us back? Because somewhere in victory, we lose our head. Somewhere in receiving from God, we begin to float and forget about God. Somewhere in conquering, getting over the Jordan River and getting to the promised land gets us carried away. So God always has to bring us back to zero so we refocus our attention. So this word that I'm bringing to you today, I thoroughly understand it. Great men face great defeat. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a preacher, whether you're a gospel singer, whether you're a president, whether you're what this morning, great men face defeat. So I must establish that this morning because we walk around believing that because we are Christians and we are living according to the word of God, we shall not have, we shall not have defeat. We shall not come back to zero. But it is in the scripture where great men must come back to zero. So I'm going to walk you on this journey and prove to you through the word of God that God has a reason for, to take us back to defeat. I must also let you understand that God will bring victory in spite of all the defeats. God will bring victory in spite of all your defeats. Now I need you to say that over your life this morning. My God will bring victory over all my defeats in spite of all the defeats in spite of all the strongholds in spite of rock bottom victory is coming put your hands together for your God let us look at the battle of I as an object lesson to help us see some more things we need to remember when we are facing victory out of our defeat. Now, I don't know where you are sitting this morning, physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, but at some point in your life, you walked in this door feeling defeated. Well, now I'm talking to somebody. It's okay if you want to hide and mask it. That's okay. It makes you feel more holy. <laughs> But the reality is, Sister Laverne, we all walk through this door with some part of our dimension feeling like we're on a defeat road. Feeling like if God is up at it again and we are done at it at the end. We walk through that door feeling like, God, when are you going to do this, God? I'm really trusting you. I'm going to get this. Is why it was so hard to get your praise on. This is why it was so hard for some people to just run to the altar. I'm going to stick with it, God. I feel so defeated, it don't make sense coming to the altar. Huh. I feel so weighed down with this problem, God. It don't make sense coming to the altar. I'm just going to stay here with my defeat. 
I want to tell you something. I want to challenge you this morning that the only reason God allow you to go to defeat is to take you to victory. And if you choose to remain in defeat, uh, you are going to die broken. So applaud the people who ran to the altar because you took it very early this morning. You said, God, I'm waiting for the word, God. I'm going to just run and take some victory this morning, God, because I came through this door with a real defeat in my life, and I'm not going back the same way I came. I applaud you this morning for getting radical about your victory because victory is taken. It's not given. So the first thing we need to remember in those dark days that we are all going through at some point in our season, God has a plan. When you are facing something that seems defeating, it can be hard to believe that God has a plan in all of it. Oh, I'm not talking to the world. I'm talking to you this morning. I'm talking to you because I've been there and I'm still there in a lot of things. It's hard seeing God. When the problem is bigger than you. When the financial deficit is bigger than you. It's hard believing that God has a plan. When you are being dragged through the mud. When your name is all over the place. It's hard seeing God having a plan. When the doctor tells you you're going to have to do surgery. It's hard seeing God as a plan when you have a diagnosis of a deadly disease. But in it all, God has a plan. It's hard believing God has a plan when you lose your home. It's hard believing that God has a plan when you lose your marriage. <laughs> Woo! It's hard believing God has a plan when you lose your child. But I want to leave you with this first point. God has a plan. No matter what you are facing this morning, God has a plan. Psalms 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his ways. God is ordering our steps this morning. Though it may look like you're going up a slope this morning. Though it may look like there's only holes in the road. God said, I'm ordering your steps. I wonder what the average soldier on the battlefield was thinking when he said, I want to be an army soldier. And they said, listen, your first tour is going to be in Afghanistan. I wonder what ran through that soldier's mind. I'm just signing up for a job. <laughs> but really what I'm signing up for is a death sentence. I'm really hoping that they send me to the base, but they say your first store is going to be Afghanistan. Oh my God. That's what happened to believers who become Christians. We say God just put us on the base. God just sent us to the nice church. But then you realize, God said, your first door is Afghanistan. And you say, God, I ain't ready for Afghanistan. I don't even know how to use my weapons properly. I never kill a man. Well, this was Joshua and these men situation. They had now crossed over. And they were in the whole awe that God was with them. <laughs> You know, after God did something amazing in your life, we can float on cloud for some months. We're still riding on that testimony. Oh, he did it. Oh, my God. Hey, hey, hey. You're still, every time people see, hey, you're smiling, so you don't know, and I, you don't know. We're riding on clouds for what God did for months. And then with the riding, sin happens. And you find yourself back at zero, and you act like you don't know how to get back on the cloud. The reality is the same way you got on the cloud before, you have the ability to do it again. Every person here who has faced, de faced defeat in some part of your life, you have once seen victory. You know the remedy to victory. 
You know the match the victory. So let's work it out today. So they came over and they are over in the promised land, but something happens. Someone goes to Jericho and they steals a Babylonian garment. And it's buried under their tent. But they don't know sin is in the camp until they are defeated. So before we can look at chapter 8, I read it first because we like to hear good stuff. We always like to hear about victory. But there's no victory without defeat. In order for you to walk away the victor, something would have had to be defeated. Sometimes the defeated person is you. Sometimes the defeated person is the enemy. But this morning, it all depends on how you look at it. Here it is. They come out from Jericho with all their hallelujahs because the walls came down. But on their way to ride in the cloud, somebody's not contented with the cloud. Somebody steals a Babylonian garment and jewelry and his name is Achan. He buries it behind, be, below his tent that he's living and because of it, they only found out when they went to pursue I. That they just had a victory, but now they are in defeat. It's a small amount of people and Joshua cannot understand why they lost. Joshua asked God how. And God said, somebody disobeyed me. I read it for you. They were unfaithful. I want you to notice God did not say to Joshua, Achan was unfaithful. Let's go back to the word. I don't want you to say Pastor Jay said. Verse seven, chapter 7 verse 1 says, but the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan stole, but yet when God looks at the people, he blames the Israelites. Because the leader is accountable for ensuring that nobody came back with stuff they weren't supposed to have. See how we can put our leaders in some really, really dark places. We can cost, you can cost your leader some really, 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 some really bad pain. Because you decided to do your own thing. So here it is. Achan hides something and they went and spy all the same land of I. And they're telling themselves, we can defeat I, you know. Just send a little measly little bit of men over there, man. That's a small thing. But only to know, getting there. To their surprise, the little man had them running. Because sin will cause anybody to run. I'm just laying some foundations. I ain't preaching yet. I want to read to you a little story. You know I like stories for presentation, right? At the age of seven, guess who he is? If you can guess who he is, I'm going to award you after. At the age of seven, he had to go to work to help support his family. At the age of nine, his mother died. At the age of 22, he lost, he lost his job as a store clerk. At 23, he went into debt and became a partner in a small store. At 26, his partner died, leaving him with a huge debt. By the age 35, he had been defeated twice when running for a seat in Congress. At the age of 37, he won the election. At 39, he lost the election. At 41, his four-year-old son died. At 42, he was rejected. At 45, he ran for Senate and lost. At 47, he was defeated for nomination as vice president. At 49, he ran for Senate again and lost again. At age 51, he was elected president of the United States of America. During his second term of office, he was assassinated. But his name lives on. Who am I? Abraham Lincoln. How could a man 
that the world has remembered to be so great, the greatest president America has ever had, the man that caused peace treaties in the middle of war, a man that wasn't just a president, but he took the arms, he took the guns, and he went on the battlefield and negotiated. A man that fought for black people. But here it is, on his way to the success, if you can count the amount of times he has been defeated, it's too much to count. My question was, how could he have continued why did he continue is the better question. Why didn't he quit? Why didn't he look at all the negatives and say God isn't here? Why didn't he say that God is not with me? But yet in the midst of adversity, this man who is not a Christian like you coming to church every Sunday morning, in the midst of adversity, still found himself back in the race. Some of us, we ain't going through nothing. And you can't serve God the way God wants you to serve him. We make excuses to remain defeated. When God has given us opportunity to become victorious. This morning, as I get into this word, I want to take you from a defeated life to a life of victory. I want to show you that when God intended to put you at zero, it was never for your bad. It was all for your good. I've learned through this study today that everything about winning is everything about losing. Well, I'm going to say it again. Because somebody needs to catch it and I'm going to go deep this morning. Can I get a little more? Vibes, thank you. I have learned this morning that everything about winning is everything about losing. You see, we live in a world where everybody wants to win and nobody wants to lose. But even the greatest army must go through defeat in order to become the greatest army. I've come to understand that God doesn't move on from a battle until it is complete. I'm going to speak to somebody who's understanding because I can't speak to people who are not understanding. I'll stay on this side. When you're ready for me, people on this side, make some more noise. Amen. Now listen to me. Here it is, we have a, a belief that as long as we've passed through something, God is finished with it. God doesn't finish a battle until he's complete with the battle. You may have lost the battle, but at some point in your life, God is going to have you revisit that battle again. And if it hasn't been finished, he's going to have you revisit it again. And if it still isn't finished, you're going to come back to it again. Some battles are going to be fought seven times. Some battles will be fought two times. Because what God wants you to learn in the first, you didn't get it. What God wants you to do in the second, you didn't get it. What God wants you to do in the third, you didn't get it. Oh my God. You see, God doesn't delight in battles that are lost. God delights in battles that are won. So when you lose a battle, God doesn't forget the battle. God's intention is to revisit the battle at a different course in your life where you become victorious. My God, Father, help me here. The reason you're still in defeat is because God has you revisiting some stuff. You are not getting correct. If we go right now and we can plug each and every one of us lives into a monitor, 
You will see the same battles you are facing right now. And the same battles you faced a year ago. And the same battles you faced in 2013. And the same battles you faced in 2012. Uh, and here they are again in 2017. Because you haven't learned from defeat. Oh my God. I know, I know that's true. Without a shadow of a doubt. Every battle that has recurred, reoccurred in my life that I've seen before is because I lost it when it came. God doesn't move off a battle until it's complete. You might move off, but God's going to bring you back at a different time and a different place. Why do I say that? We go to verse, we go to chapter 8. After a fall, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid, go back. They just lost. And I found out it was amazing that even though they were defeated because they sinned against God, look at it this morning, God holds no hard feelings. Look at it this morning. God is not the judge to keep you in defeat, but actually God has a plan to bring you to victory. Listen, listen to it, listen to it. They just failed God. They should be sodomized. They should be the people that God cut off. But here it is. God is making up a plan to get them to victory. As soon as they repented, God is saying, listen to me, Joshua. Get up, 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 get up. Get up. God doesn't want you in defeat. God doesn't want you to stay in defeat. Know that God has a plan this morning. God has already thought of a plan while you were sleeping. God has already thought of a plan while you were crying. God has already thought of a plan when you was asking God, how is it going to work? God said, I've got a plan for you. Oh, just wait if you only saw the plan. You won't be crying. How about what egg can then? You will say, God, make us over. God, take us over. God, take us time. I need some people who've been crying to stop crying. I need some people who've been crying to stop crying. It's high time you stop crying and start asking God, take me back to the battlefield where I walk out victorious. This time, God, I ain't losing this battle, God, but I'm coming out. Hey, 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 hey. This one is not written. This one is Holy Ghost first prayer. God said, hmm. When God takes you back to a battle, thank you, Holy Ghost. When God takes you back to a battle that he has you to revisit, say, thank you, Lord. Hear why you're saying, thank you, Lord. Because you got an opportunity of a lifetime to redeem the battle. God said, you're going to redeem the battle. But you're not going to redeem it your way. You're going to redeem it my way. Oh, I feel that one just dropped into somebody's, somebody's court. God said, you're not going to redeem it your way. The reason you failed the last time is because you tried to redeem it your way. He said, but this time, you're going to redeem I my way. So here's what he said to, to Joshua. He said, Joshua, take courage. He said, for I am with you. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack I. For I have delivered into your hands the king of I. You see, before you did it your way, you went to deliver the king in your hand. But this time, I've got a plan for the king and it's in your hand. This program comes to you compliments of the Tobago Inspirational Network. To support this and other programs, we encourage you to give to TIN. Contributions can be made at any First Citizens Bank at account number 203-4679. We thank you for your support.